Let's pray. We'll get to work. God, thank you for a, 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 just a wonderful day. Thank you for a chance to, to gather together as your people, to sing your praises, to be encouraged, to greet one another, and, and to share in partnership and in friendship in the gospel. And so we're glad for those things. I pray that you would encourage us today, speak to us today. And, and Father, we do ask that you would continue to go before us in this uh, project. Some days it seems too big. And so, God, I just pray you would continue to go before us and give us continued favor as some of the, as we sort of break tape on the design phase of the project and move into the build phase. And so, uh, God, go before us. I pray that you would help us make the right decision related to uh, contractors and, and all the things. So, God, just go before us. Uh, we love you. We're glad to meet with you today. I pray that today uh, is glorifying to you and edifying to us, encouraging to us. It is in Jesus' great name. Everybody said, amen, amen. We're back in Philippians this morning, wrapping up our summer series. Uh, should finish chapter three this morning, and we'll, we'll launch into chapter four, the final chapter, uh, uh, just barely. I'm, I'm just going to tease it. We're just going to be in there one verse, uh, but that's where we're going this morning. We'll be starting at about verse 16-ish, aiming at, uh, aiming at moving in that last section, 17, through the close of the chapter. So that's the plan. I hope this has been uh, encouraging for you. I hope you have found this series uh, spiritually uh, re-energizing. Um, maybe you've been able to experience even some spiritual rest in it. Uh, so I'm glad for it. This little book of Philippians, four chapters, is certainly one of the best books in the Bible to do that if, encour if encouragement is what you need. Paul loved this church. And not just, and I thought about this this week, not just institutionally or organizationally. Like, you, you, this church is, it, it looks like a healthy church. They're putting up good numbers, so I love this church. This isn't an affection based on um, numbers, performance. This is an affection. Because he knows them personally. He was there by the river when he met with that, in Acts 16, when he met with that early, with the church before it was formed, when he met with them and prayed with them. He likely saw many of them come to Christ. These faces had names and these names were a deep source of joy for him. So this isn't just a, you know, I can imagine as a pastor, when some, I hear from pastor friends of mine about how their church is going. I go, man, I love that church. Man, I love the work they're doing in whatever town. I don't really know those people personally. I know the pastor, but I don't know the people. And I love that church. Well, that's partnership. That's institutional, organizational affection for a church. Like, I love the work you're doing. This is a personal, a deeply personal affection that he has for these people. And you can sense that. It comes off the page. He loved them. In the opening of the letter, he makes that abundantly clear, telling them that he, this is chapter one, verse seven, that he holds them in his heart. He treasures their partnership with him in the gospel. That's chapter one, verse five. And partnership is different for us in our context than if you go back to a Greco-Roman culture. Partnership was another word for friendship. So the word there is actually, I, I treasure your partnership. Partnership is that reciprocal kind of giving and receiving. Yeah, that's friendship in the Greco-Roman world. And so it's more than just, for us, we think of that more in business, like we're partners. Now this is friendship. And it's a friendship in the gospel. He also says that he, this is verse eight of chapter one, he yearns for all of them with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for all of you. I wish I could be with you. And that affection is from Christ. So these are not empty words for Paul. You see them all through the book. Have you ever been to a concert? We had the Jamboree uh, last weekend. I don't know if you went or not. I try to avoid it like the plague. But have you ever been to a concert... You, you, you know, it's one of your favorite bands, and, and you're in you know, the concert, and there's a huge crowd, and the band takes the stage, you know, hey, Portland, and everyone's like, hi, and everyone's screaming, and you're like, yeah, and they play their set. Inevitably, it seems, sometime during the set, they will say, 
You guys are the best crowd we have played for all tour. We love you. And everybody's like, yeah, we're the best. And you're like, okay, really? Like, what's the criteria for this affection? I like, like this, is, this is crowd working 101. You guys are the best crowd we've seen all. This is crowd working 101. This is not what Paul is doing. He's not working a crowd. He's not playing to his fan base to get clicks, likes, and streams. Like, that's not what he's doing. He loves them. And contextually, it's not the kind of love, you know, like that, that we often, it, that's easy to have when things are good. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's been tested. They've gone through stuff. I want you to think about those you love deeply. What stuff have you gone through together? As a way of building that affection, strengthening that affection. Their, their love for each other, the church and Paul, the love between them had been tested. Paul is in prison as he writes this letter. He's suffering, and they have suffered right along with him. There's that giving and receiving, that reciprocal nature of this partnership. This friendship. You're in prison, then we're in prison. What do you need? I want to show you a couple of things really quick. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but this is an opportunity to connect some texts together, okay? I want you to look up on the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. We studied this at length last year when we launched our Leaning In initiative. Look at this. He's writing to the Corinthian church in this letter, and look what he says. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, remember we talked about that, those two things together are quite curious. Abundance of joy and extreme po poverty, those things came together. Oh, well, that's interesting. He says, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. That's an interesting equation. If you, and we sat with it back last fall. That's an interesting equation. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Look at this a couple of chapters later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verses 7 through 9. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Now, I don't want to get lost here, but Paul's relationship with the Corinthian church is a little bit different than his relationship with the Philippian church. His relationship with the Corinthian church, he loved them, but it was a contentious relationship. They had a lot of accusations at times against him, and he had to always answer questions, and no, you misunderstood, and that's not what I said. And th there's indications that he wrote other letters to them trying to smooth things over, and sometimes it seemed to make things worse. And so one of the accusations here is he's being thrown in with these false apostles, if you will, who were coming in and just trying to take from them. You see these on late night TV on certain channels. Guys just trying to take from you. And he gets lumped in with them. So he's saying, I, I, I preach to you free of charge. Look at what he said. I robbed other churches. I didn't rob you. And then he uses the same language. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from, here it is, Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. So because that accusation is false. This, I took nothing from you. In fact, these guys over here in Macedonia were the ones who were taking care of me. I didn't rob you. Now look at this. This is Philippians chapter four. We haven't gotten there yet. It was kind of you to share my trouble. Again, now he's writing to the Philippians again. And, and he's identifying that they're sharing in his trouble. So there's the context. They're sharing in his suffering. 
And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. This church in Philippi, from the very beginning by the river in Acts 16, they have been stepping up when there was a need. If the church was in need, they were there to give. If Paul was in need, they were there to give. We are with you. You're in prison, we're in prison. You're in need, then we're in need. This is the partnership that he has been talking about. And they're sharing in his sufferings, but not just financially. Look at this. Uh, if you want, you can flip back to, to chapter one. I'll put it on the screen as well. But this is, look at verse 27 of chapter one. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that'll come up again today in chapter three. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Again, that sounds a lot like chapter three, a lot like what we were talking about last week, straining forward to what lies ahead. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. Huh. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction that will come up, that will come up again today too, that destruction but of your salvation, but of your salvation. So their destruction, your salvation. And that, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, look at this, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The Philippians are suffering themselves in very similar ways to Paul. They have opponents too. He has opponents. They're being accused of things too. Paul's been accused of things. We talked about this last week. Following Christ will cost you. And we want to be clear that this is not the, an earning kind of cost, like you pay it and then you've earned your salvation. We talked about that last week. It's not an earning cost. But it's still a cost, amen? Like it's still a cost. To follow Jesus costs me something. And more than something. Everything. I love how one author put it, this is Kent Hughes. If your Christianity has not brought discomfort to your life, something is wrong. Anybody shocked by that statement at all? You're like, no, totally. Like, you don't even need me to say it. You're like, yeah, that guy nailed it. Okay. If your Christianity has not brought discomfort to your life, something is wrong. I think that's why I find the encouragement in Philippians so valuable. Because it's hard fought. It's, it's battle tested. It's not some empty, you know, Hallmark-esque, you know, type of sentiment. You know, like we're just scribbling, you know, some word salad on a page. I hope you're encouraged. It's an encouragement that is soaked in language of hardship, struggle, and loss. That's the great irony of the book of Philippians. There's so much encouragement even while saying things like this. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. <sighs> Chapter one, verse 27. Chapter two, verse three. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Is that easy? <sighs> Chapter two, verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Ugh. Chapter two, verse 17, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, look at this, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. <laughs> even if that's what happens, I'm gonna be glad about, what? 
And then what we looked at last week in chapter 3, forgetting what is behind and straining is the word he uses, forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's hard. And I think that's why the encouragement in Philippians is of such value because you read it on the page and it's, 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 it's couched in or soaked in all this language of hardship and yet joy. And yet, encouragement. And yet, words like, I'm glad, and I rejoice, and I will always, and I'm content with all things. Whoa! None of that sounds easy, and yet you read it and deeply encouraged, and that continues today. But first, I want to go back. Look at verse 16. This is where we're going to start. Get a running start at verse 17. I got to the end of the sermon last week in verse 16 and kind of had to just wrap up. And I want, to, I want to touch back there, do a little work, and then we'll continue in verse 17. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. This was, uh, uh, where am I? Kind of a concluding thought as he moves forward. Look at this. Only let us, here it is, hold true, Hold true, that could also be translated live up to. So live up to. Hold true to what? To what we have attained. That's past tense. Did you notice that? So hold true or live up to what we have attained. Now the tension here is fascinating. I want to make sure we teased it a little bit in conclusion last week. I want to make sure it has a spot this week. There is a tension there, and it is fascinating. What did Paul just say back in verse 12? Okay, so if you think about a bookcase, and you got some books on the bookcase, but they're not at the edges of the bookcase, they're right in the middle. What what do you typically have here, and what do you typically have here? we, We call them bookends, to kind of hold those books together. Well, chapter, verse 16 and verse 12 are the bookends of what, of everything he said last week. They're the bookends. Now I want you to look at the bookends. Look what he said in the first bookend in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So at the first bookend on this side of the shelf, he's saying, I haven't yet obtained this. Whatever it is he's straining towards, towards. that was last week. I'm not gonna get into that again. I have yet to obtain it here. That's verse 12. What's verse 16 say? Hold true to what we have already attained. Tension. This experience of I have yet not obtained it, so I'm going to press on, and this, we're going to hold true to what we have already attained. Tension. It's the same tension we see when he says, I'm, I'm not already perfect in verse 12. And then in verse 15, he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. So there's two bookends again. I'm not yet perfect, but I am mature. Perfect and mature in the original language share the same root. They're the same root word. So at this bookend, he's saying, I haven't obtained it. Here he's saying, we have attained. Here he's saying, I'm not yet perfect. And here he's saying, I am mature. So he's basically saying this, in this little section that is bookended by 12 and 16. He is saying this. If you are truly mature or perfect, then you will realize that you are not yet mature or perfect. That's the tension. Beautifully written, perfect, not perfect, mature, not mature, attained, yet not obtained. Church, listen to me. This is what spiritual maturity looks like in real life. If you've got some vision of some tailored version that you have up on a wall and you're trying to be that thing, like that's spiritual maturity in real life. If you heard people say, man, the older I get, the, the, the less I'm convinced I know. Yeah. Yeah. The longer I live, the less I know. Even while I'm learning lots. You know what I found as a pastor? I remember when I was 20, in my 20s, 
I was so sure I knew what the text meant. To the degree that I look back and I have some shame about it because I was a cocky young guy preaching. So sure he knew what it meant. Now that I'm 50, I've been studying the same text probably for years and years and years. How certain you think I am of some of these texts today? Nah, I don't know. I mean, this is my best guess, but I don't really know. That's not to say that God gave us scripture. He did not give us scripture so that we might know him. No, we talked about that last week. No, that we would know him and he revealed himself to us in scripture. Don't mishear me. I'm talking about the attitude of certainty. God can be known here. Yes, that's why he gave. I'm talking about that cocky attitude of I know what that means. And the older I get, you're like, I think that's what it means. That's what spiritual maturity looks like. Perfect, not perfect. Mature, not mature. Attained, yet not obtained. So this brings up a common motif that is in Scripture that we've talked about a lot. I haven't talked about it at length in quite some time. I look back at the archives. When's the last time I taught on this? It's been a minute, so I'm going to take a minute. This is a common motif in Scripture, and it, it, it's an uh, experience that we've had in Scripture. We have Scripture, we read it, and we see these kinds of tension, this kind of tension that we see in Philippians chapter 3, and, and we're glad for it. You see the same kind of tension in Romans chapter 7. There's other places where you see the same tension. You go, okay, the Bible talks about these promises, and yet when I go out my door in the morning, I'm experiencing something different than I seem to be seeing in the promises of God on the page. So this tension is not just a textual tension that we see in Romans chapter 7, we see in Philippians chapter 3. It's an experiential tension. What are we supposed to do with that tension? And scholars have had to come up with a theological term. It's more of a, more of a phrase than a term. To kind of explain this tension. And, and it's the already and the not yet. Okay, you familiar with that phrase? The already and the not yet. What, is it, what does it mean? Without it, listen, without this theological term or phrase, the Christian life can be more than just challenging. It can be just downright frustrating and disappointing. Because we have all of these expectations based on all of these promises that we read in Scripture, and yet I'm not experiencing them right now. I thought we were, and then, and then this. And so the already and the not yet. There's a disparity between some of what we read on the page and some of, if not most of, what we experience in this life. So it's our own experiences, is what we're experiencing outside, so it's both internal and external. So, okay, this doesn't match what I believe the gospel is supposed to be doing in the world. tension, and thus the phrase, the already and the not yet. What does it mean? Briefly, it means that the church is operating in a sort of in-between. In-between what? In-between the two advents or the two arrivals of Christ. So we have the first advent or the first arrival of Christ where he came, born of a virgin, and he came and became flesh. John chapter 1, verse 14, and he made his dwelling among us. There's the first advent, the first arrival of Christ. He lived perfectly in our place. He was without sin, as Hebrews talks about. And he goes to the cross in our place for our sin. And then what does he say on the cross? It is finished. And then you get up the next morning and you go, doesn't feel finished to me. The already and the not yet. When he said it is finished, he wasn't kidding. He, in fact, definitively secured the righteousness of God that is by faith that Romans 1 talks about that becomes our own righteousness by faith, 
fantastic, and he paid the penalty for sin, which is death. That's Genesis chapter two. That's Romans chapter six, by which he conquered both Satan, sin, and death. Is that done? Come on, church. Yeah, that, that's done. That's finished. And then you wake up and you go, yeah, but look, and yeah, but look, and yeah, but look. Yeah, already and not yet. Well, what's the, what's the not yet? Look, at, I, I want to make this very, very clear concerning the already. Listen, there is nothing else that is required to secure your eternal salvation. It is done. We are not waiting for that anymore. And yet, we're still waiting for the second advent or the second arrival of Christ. This is that in-between. There's the first arrival. Here's the second arrival where he's going to come back and and we're going to have the new heavens and the new earth. What does Jesus say in Revelation? Behold, I'm making all things new. Yeah, all things have not been made new yet. It's been secured though. We just have yet to see it to fulfillment. It's the in-between, the already and the not yet. And that's the experience. A professor of mine from way back, uh, Dr. Greg Allison, he says this, that there is a sojourner, sojourner is a weird word, we don't use that word much anymore, a sojourner element to the church. That's our experience, sojourner. What's a sojourn? Does anybody know the definition of the word sojourn? I looked, I had to look it up, but I like to look things up. It's simply this. It's a temporary stay. So when you get an Airbnb somewhere and you're gonna go, yeah, that's a sojourn. It's a temporary stay. In a bed that's not yours, on pillows that aren't yours, using dishes that aren't yours, using... Temporary stay. Church, that is our every day. I don't want to reduce it to say we're in an Airbnb. It's a little flippant, but this, this is not our home. This bed is not our bed. These pillows are not our pillows. These dishes are not our dishes. And one day, he is going to return, and he will have restored all things something he secured here, bring it to restoration here, and he's making all things new, the already and the not yet. We have examples all through scripture. Again, I said it's a, it's a biblical motif. What does that mean? It means it's thematic. It keeps showing up in imagery. Some of the obvious examples are you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob living in the promised land long before they ever possessed it. God gave it to them. This is your land but there are other people here. Yeah, we'll get to that, but this is your land. They never got to take possession of it in their lifetime. But they lived in the land, it just, so it was given to them already. It just, they didn't get to possess it yet. Moses and Midian is another good example. Israel in the wilderness after Egypt is another good example. We're on our way to the the promised land. We're gonna spend 40 years in the wilderness. That's a sojourn. This is a temporary stay. We're on our way to the promised land. You have the church uh, in the church age in the book of Acts. That, again, temporary stay. We're in between two advents. This is the already and the not yet. Here's how Allison puts it. As the community of Christ, the church has experienced the decisive, I love that word, decisive intervention of the age to come, bringing salvation, in part, the knowledge of God, in part, deliverance from sin, in part, the power of the Holy Spirit, in part, purity and unity, in part, eternal life, in part, and so forth. These blessings of the already are indeed real and powerful, yet they are incomplete and pale in comparison with what is still to come. That is Romans chapter eight, if you wanna write that in your notes and read it later today. That is Romans chapter eight. 
When Christ returns in glory, then the not yet will be fully realized. The church will be presented to Christ in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy and without blemish. Can you say that of yourself right now? By faith you can already because that righteousness is yours by faith. But Romans chapter seven tells you, yeah, but I still do these things. Yep. I still, ha- I still wrestle with, yep, but I still have this problem with, uh-huh. That's the already and the not yet. So has God been idle in the in-between? Is this just some arbitrary period of time where like, are you done yet for crying out loud? Can you not see what's going on around us? Has he been idle? I want more confidence in that. No, he has not been idle. There is a very real work he is doing and has invited invited us into as his people, the church. He's tirelessly working. And Paul says he will bring that work to completion at the day of Christ in Philippians chapter one, verse six. So let's go back to the cross chart from last week. Remember that? You guys are here? A lot of you I'm looking at and go, you were camping or something last week because I didn't see you here. So we're going to hit this again. I want to expand on it a little bit uh, this morning, but I want to look again at the cross chart. Now, this again from my friend. I first learned of it from my friend's book, uh, Pastor Bob Thune. He wrote a book called The Cross-Centered Life. It's actually some study material, really, really good. That's where I first engaged it, but he will tell you it did not originate with him. He just got permission to use it in the book. So uh, I don't know really where it came from. Super, super helpful. Okay, this is how it all works. This is how we bring the already and the not yet and all that stuff together. And I'm gonna do this real quick. I'm gonna do two charts today. Uh, I'm gonna expand on the one from last week. So let's remind ourselves how it goes. Here's a timeline. So this is just time right here. You, You can't see that, but you don't need to. And then our point of... Conversion, the, the moment where we become Christians. The scripture uses the language of new creation in Christ, where you've been remade in the image of God. From this point forward, two things happen. We increasingly become aware of two things once we have become Christians. One is the holiness of God. It's not that God becomes more holy as we grow. It's just that we're more aware of exactly how holy he is. So you have an understanding here of God's holiness, which through over time is only gonna grow. Oh, I thought it was this. It's actually this. But trust me, uh, you'll wake up here in a few days and realize it's actually this. Like that's how it works. So you have an increasing awareness. As a Christian, you have an increasing awareness of the holiness of God. What's the other thing we become increasingly aware of? Our sinfulness. And the the beautiful thing about this already and not yet, this work that God's doing that that Paul is certain that he's gonna bring to completion at the day of Christ is that at every point we become more aware of God's holiness and more aware of our, uh, our sinfulness. The gospel, the grace of God, what he has accomplished in Christ is always enough. So what happens is we also become increasingly aware of what the gospel actually is. This is why, if I may, the gospel continues to be relevant to the Christian long after they were saved. I I remember years ago, this is probably more than a decade ago, so don't try to figure out who it is. I remember a long time ago, someone says, all you guys talk about is the gospel here, I wanna go deeper. And they left our church. This idea that the gospel or the good news of Jesus is only relevant to me when I'm a non-Christian and then become a Christian. Once I become a Christian, I don't need the gospel anymore. We need to move on to other things, which is usually, you know, camouflage for all the weird stuff they want to get into. They want to talk about prophecy and, oh, I had this dream, Pastor, about that. And I'm like, ugh. The gospel continues to be, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, But I promise you, the gospel is as relevant today as the day you got saved. 
as your awareness of God's holiness grows and your sinfulness grows, what is going to bridge this gap for you? The gospel. This is the work God is doing in the in-between. And he is not idle. It will be completed. And this explains then why, Philippians chapter three, why we strain (laughs) forward to what lies ahead. Because uh, I don't know how long you've been a Christian. I don't know how long you've been a Christian. I'm sure we range in this room. But I think you would agree with me and say, I don't know what point you're at, but you would go, yeah, straining is the right word. It's the right word for what I experience in the in-between. A pressing on, a standing firm, a straining towards what is ahead. You are absolutely right. Okay. Now I want to expand on it a little bit. Uh, I teased this again last week, but didn't want to confuse you and didn't want to mess up my drawing, so I didn't. So I determined to do it this week. This is what happens when we disbelieve, or my friend puts it like this, it's not just disbelieve, it's misbelieve. And I like that distinction. It's not just disbelieve, it's misbelieve. So this is something that even as a Christian, you can miss this, you can misbelieve this. Have a misunderstanding of this. And then not experience the effects of what it is that God is doing or intends to do in your life. So, so here's, here's what, the, the first part of it looks the same. Hopefully you'll be able to see it, but again, there's time. So this is a timeline. Here's the point again where you come to know Christ and then you have an awareness, an increased awareness of God's holiness, God's holiness and our sinfulness, okay? That all looks the same. Here's what can happen. And this is why Paul calls us a strain towards what lies ahead. Sometimes... (laughs) maybe most of the time, we don't want to do the work. We have an expectation that this should be easier than it is. We don't want to actually encounter and wrestle with the holiness of God to its greater extent. Like, that's a lot. I don't want to wrestle with an increased awareness of my sin. That's a lot. I just don't want to do that. When we do that, my friend says we adjust the record. We adjust the record. What does that mean? That means that that when you you consider um, uh, 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 the increasing awareness of our sin, what we do in this space is we actually pretend We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna pretend, and this is where, you know, you're gonna experience a lot of um, this space here. You're gonna experience a lot of shame. You're gonna experience a lot of guilt. Gonna be a lot of fear in this space. Gonna be a lot of despair in this space, and so on and so forth. We're gonna pretend. So we're gonna, we're gonna bridge the gap between our increased awareness of our sin and our limited view of the gospel. And the only way you're going to fill that gap is you're going to, you're going to have to pretend. And remember last week I picked up the rug. We're going to just start sweeping under the rug a little bit, stomping it down. We're just going to pretend. Yeah, things are great. For many, this is, this is Sunday morning 101. I'm going to put a, fi- a smile on it. I'm going to walk in. I'm going to greet everybody. Yeah, things are good. How are you doing? Great, great week. God, God is good. Praise God. And they're going to go home to whatever this is. Okay, what about up here? if we don't want to actually wrestle with an increased awareness of God's holiness, ah, okay, what we do up here is we perform. Okay. And this is where you're going to find things like self-righteousness. You're going to find uh, moralism. You're going to find legalism, pride, and so forth. And and here's fundamentally the problem. What happens to the gospel? Well, nothing. 
It just stays the same. What my friend calls a limited view of the gospel, a small view of the gospel. In church, what's the problem with the small view of the gospel? Listen to me, you will not, I promise you, you will not experience the transformation that God intends to bring to your life in and through the work of the gospel. The gospel is meant to transform you. It is not a set of beliefs that you just intellectually adhere to. It is everything in life. It answers the story, it answers questions related to your origin. It answers questions to why the in-between. It answers questions to what is coming. It answers all of that. And it, all the hardships and the difficulties and the in-between, the gospel addresses specifically. That's why it doesn't bother me. I, but it makes a ton of sense to me when I hear a non-Christian say, how come you're not a Christian? And they'll answer the question like this. Well, I just, I, I'm driven more by logic than faith as if what I just explained to you is not reasonable and logical. I'm driven more by science. I'm driven more by, by, by logic. God is, Scripture says, the Bible says, that God is both sovereign and good. And then I look around at the world around me, and I see, and you can list off any number of atrocities, and then that returns me to the question, God is, well, he can't be both of those. He can't be sovereign and good. He could be sovereign and bad, or he could not be sovereign and he could be good. But these things would not exist if God was both sovereign and good, to the Christian who understands the gospel, we go, oh, in the in-between it does. In the in-between it does. It makes a ton of sense that God can be both God, sovereign and good and that these things can happen in this world. In the in-between, it absolutely is reasonable and makes a ton of sense. But one day, a day is coming. A day is coming, right? And Jesus is gonna come back. He's making all things new and all will be put to right. But he secured it back here. And he'll bring it to completion here at the day of Christ, the great and magnificent day of the Lord, the prophets say. Does that make sense? I hope you start going, you're looking at your own life going, oh, well, that explains it. It's why it's so helpful. It helps us understand the in-between. Why he says, I have yet to obtain it. I don't know how far this is gonna go. In this life, I don't know where we're going. I might be here and I'm like going, I don't know. I expect to grow in an awareness of God's holiness and to grow, grow in, in, in an awareness of my sin, but I don't know how far this thing's gonna reach. But I know that one day, as Corinthians says, I will know as I am fully known that there will be a day of completion. <sighs> Just not yet. And so I'm gonna strain forward to what lies ahead of me. And I'm gonna stand firm in that. And I'm gonna live up to what I've already attained, even though I have yet to obtain it. Tracking? It, it's, it's beautiful. This is why, church, Paul says he wants to know Christ more than anything else. Everything, and he means everything. He considers garbage in comparison, and therefore, I, I count it all loss, he says earlier in chapter three, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And this is why Paul talks about forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, so. Hopefully that brings some clarity to not just the text, but hopefully some clarity to your own life and your own experiences. Okay, Paul's gonna shift gears. We're gonna get to 17. Whoa! I draw pictures and I lose time. Okay. Hopefully that work will serve as a good preface to help us move relatively quickly. Okay. Look at verse 17. Okay, now he's gonna shift gears a bit. We've got that little section. It's book ended nice with chapter 12, with verse 12 and verse 16. Now he's gonna shift gears. Look at this, brothers. So again, affectionate language, brothers. This is family. Look what he says. Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. Do you feel the urgency? 
the passage, the, the piece of that verse that stands out to me is like, keep your eyes on. Like that jump, like circle that, that is emphatic. Like keep your eyes on, like don't, parents, okay. You're in a busy parking lot with young kids or you're, you're some huge crowd at, you know, I don't know, Disneyland or something. Keep your eyes on takes on a whole new meaning in that moment, does it not? Keep your eyes eyes on. Because what happens if you take your eyes off, even just for, I was just, I was just, all I wanted to do was, I was only. And it's not because the kids are looking for her. She's not looking, go! (laughs) It's just that they're like this. And next thing you know, they're, they're gone. My daughter reminded me uh, the other day, dad, you remember that time? It was one of those moments where I'm like, no. She had to tell me about it, so it's fresh in my mind now. She said, you remember that time I got lost in Disneyland? I'm like, what? We never lost anyone in Disneyland. I mean, I left Paige home when I went to the hardware store when she was sleeping in the crib one time, but we never lost anybody in Disneyland. Okay. She goes, no, 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 no. I, I guess you didn't really lose us. Remember when I lost you? So again, we didn't lose her. I, we were walking into Disneyland. You know that, that, that front when you're just coming into the park. This is what she said. We were coming to the park. That is the most dense time in in the park, even though it stays dense pretty much the whole time. But, you know, you're in there. You just come through the gates. You've just done the ticket thing, and you're walking in, and you're just like, where are the kids? You know, she said, there was a moment where I was just looking at it, you know, and I was walking, and I turned around, and I didn't see you. And And now I know why she remembers it, and I don't. Because I kept my eyes on her. She just took her eyes off me. And so she goes, it was terrifying. And so because I didn't take my eyes off her, as I now remember, I got to see the look shift from sheer panic to relief. (sighs) Keep your eyes on who? on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So the first thing he tells us to do in this whole straining forward to what lies ahead, the first thing he tells us to do is to keep our eyes on those who we're straining to. And don't take your eyes off them. Uh, Paul, uh, oftentimes he gets criticized in this text as, as a, little pretentious, a little pretentious here. There's some hubris here. You know, fo- imitate me. Okay, if you're reading the whole Bible and not just one verse, if you're reading the whole letter, reading verses 12 through uh, 16 really helps with verse 17. Because the exa- imitate me, imitate him in what? In straining in not yet obtaining, but having already attained. In that, in that uh, uh, attaining, not obtained. In that perfect, not perfect. In that mature, not mature. Imitate me in that. That spiritual maturity. Church, listen. It takes a lot of intentionality to keep your eyes on and to grow in Christ. It takes none at all to drift. There is not a point where you're going, today I'm gonna drift from Christ. No, It takes a ton of intensity and intentionality and focus and keep your eyes on to follow Christ. But if you don't want to follow Christ, you don't have to do anything at all. And drifting will just just happen. So that's the example he's calling them to imitate. Church, um, imitation is a big part of what it means to be a growing Christian, a growing follower of Christ. I promise you in this room, there is someone who's out ahead of you just enough to where he still remembers and understands exactly where you are, but is cl- so close enough to still get that c- context, but far enough out to go, I'm gonna watch how you do it, and do you mind if I follow you? Yep, come on. That is biblical discipleship, it is not complicated. It's hard. But it's not complicated. Imitate me as I, Paul will say elsewhere, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's, that's the idea. Hold true to what we, you have attained. Being a disciple, being a Christian is a lot about following. 
Who are you following? Okay, so uh, early in July, sort of the front end of some time off, I had a class in Orlando. It was a full week of class, uh, working on a degree with Wheaton. And so went and went to a class. It was a really good class, one of the best I've had uh, so far, just really still uh, chewing on stuff from that class. Really, really good. But the professor, we went to Orlando because the professor is a pastor in Orlando. So rather than all of us flying to Wheaton, those of us who had to travel, we just flew to him and did class in his church for that week. Well, because we were in Orlando, he wrote into the schedule the last day we would go to the parks. Because you can't come to the Orlando and not go to the parks. And so we're like, okay. And he goes, we'll just, we'll have lots of conversations while we're standing in lots of lines and we'll just see organizational leadership in action. Because that was the class, organizational change leadership. Fascinating class. Anyway, that's not the point. So we're going to go watch organizational leadership in action. We're going to, okay, that's what we're going to do. Well, let me frame it for you a little bit. Uh, We went to Disney World on a Friday in July. That shows that we didn't learn a thing in our organizational leadership class, okay? That's what that shows me, okay? Not what you would expect from a bunch of organizational leadership grad students, but here's where the story takes an unpredictable turn. Two of the guys are East Coast guys. The professor obviously lives in, they got season passes. They'll go into the parks just for dinner. So he knows his way around. Another guy, a friend of mine, he's got young kids still. He's a pastor in South Carolina. They come all the time, all the time. So he set us up the night before. We bought our tickets online and he took his phone and he started working his magic. He added us all to one family. It's probably the weirdest family in Disney, Disney World that day. Okay, a bunch of bearded weirdos, okay? Uh, he added us all to one family. He got us all to get the genie passes, which I guess is the new way to do fast pass. You know, okay, we got it, and then we just handed it over to him digitally. You take it, okay? And he had it on his, okay, okay, good. You're here, you're here. We need to make a phone call, get you on, da-da-da. He started working this thing. Got us all on it. Church, um, we, were a, we didn't just hit one park. We hit three. We did near all the main attractions in Epcot, Hollywood Studios, and Magic Kingdom. We never waited in a line longer than about 25 minutes, and most of the lines were inside by the time we were in them, and we were in AC. It was a wonderful day. Rest of us are just visiting, chatting. All we had to do was keep our eyes on Aaron. We called him our Disney dad. And we're like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, you could market this. You could build a website. You know, we got a lot of guys who go on guided hunting trips. Like, have you ever thought about hiring a guide for Disney World? I now think there's a market for it because it was unbelievable. Somebody overheard us talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, which is a ride apparently you can't even get in line for. You got to get in a digital line. We were in it. You guys got to ride Guardians? Yeah, it's great. All we had to do was keep our eyes on someone who was familiar with where he was going. We didn't have to look at a map once. Had I gone by myself or taken my family, we'd go, what do you guys want to do first? Okay, let's wander over here and wait 90 minutes. To... Okay, what do you guys want to do next? I'm tired, I want to go home. That's about how it would go. Keep our eyes on him, and we got to experience three parks. The, the, the evening ended on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at night under the Magic Kingdom fireworks. Boom. Okay. All we had to do was keep our eyes on him. Imitation, fo- following, is a big part of what it means to be a disciple. Has someone been where you haven't been before? Follow them! And keep your eyes on them. They, they know what they're doing. Are they going to, if they're like Paul, they, they have attained by faith but have yet to obtain. So they get the whole perfect, not perfect, mature, not perfect thing. If that's the kind, follow that person. Church, this is why we do community groups. This is why we do family camp. This is why we do all of these things because if we are relationally connected to one another, that is 90% of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be connected to his people. And then when I don't know what to do when my marriage is in this place, I look to someone whose marriage was in that place and isn't anymore. 
This is not a little piece of what it means to be a Christian, and I am going to take 10 more minutes of your time. It's one service. It's a danger about one service. Okay. There's no other service that I'm going to keep long, but I'm going to take 10 minutes. Look at, look at verse 18. You can feel the urgency. Here's why the urgency. Look at verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So here's the second thing he calls us to do in the straining forward to what lies ahead. It's to be aware of the enemies of the cross, he calls them. People whose eyes are not fixed on those who are following the example that they have in Paul and company. And I want you to notice the emotion here. I have often, he says, I've often told you about these people and now tell you even to this day with tears. It's, it's like he's saying, like this grieves me deeply. That probably means these aren't the dogs he's saying to watch out for in the first part of chapter three. These are probably not the Judaizers. These might have been people that were even in the church for a time, but got like Jesus tells the parables of the various soils. You got it choked out by the world or got it snatched by the enemy and just ended up just wandering after other things. And he goes, I've told you about these people before and I can't even think about it. I got names, I got faces. I can't even talk about it without tears. But they walk as enemies to the cross. Whoa. What? See the difference? There's enemies of the cross of Christ and what it's doing in the lives of his followers and his disciples. And he goes on to describe them. Their end is destruction referred to that earlier in chapter one, earlier today as well. Their end is destruction, so he's gonna walk this thing back. Why is it destruction? Well, because they have a different God. Their God is their belly. And look at this, and their glory, and they glory in their shame. You you see, (laughs) where is their glory? Well, it's actually in something you shouldn't glorify. Their glory is actually their shame but they've glorified it. That's, you can go to Romans chapter one and Paul writes very similar things in Romans chapter one. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. And look at this, with minds set on earthly things. That's in direct contrast to so keep your eyes on those. So keep your eyes on those who walk according to the pattern and don't keep your eyes on, the, don't wander and find your eyes on these guys whose eyes are fixed where? On earthly things. Ah, church, who do you hang out with the most? Who do you hang out with the most? Where have you fixed your eyes and kept your eyes on? You see see where I'm going with this? It takes a lot of intentionality to follow Christ. It takes none at all to follow the world. And if your primary core of buddies, your drinking buddies, or your whatever buddies, these are your best friends that you do life with, I know where your life is going. I know which God you also too have, your belly. And you probably too glory in some shame. And you too probably long for earthly things. Is that, unreason- is that an unreasonable conclusion? Now, to be sure, God has called us into the world to reach, to seek and save the lost. He said, be in the world, not of the world. So we're in the world in this in-between because God is doing a work calling people unto himself. So by, this is not some sort of avoid all people who do bad things. I'm gonna just get in my closet and hide and not have to deal with, no, 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 no. No, that's not what we're talking. We're talking about where are your eyes fixed? Because if you're hanging out with all those guys and you're not bringing the gospel or you're not on mission, then I promise you, you're gonna love the things that they love. You're gonna cultivate an ad- appetite for the things that they have appetites for. That's how it works. We have, the Bible talks about this, that bad company corrupts good morals, that a little yeast works its way through the dough. Like that's how it works. Because it takes intentionality to follow Christ. It takes none at all to drift from him. I see why then he has tears. That's sad to me. I 
I think this is with the already and the not yet. This is where we can lose sight of a couple of things. One, you lose sight of the already and it's possible to miss all that God has done. Like this is missing the already and you, you just miss all that God has done for you. And you can't see the gospel fully. You miss the not yet. <laughs> Without a vision of what is still yet to be fulfilled, we will naturally look for glory in this life, not in the life to come. And you'll cultivate a God of your belly. And arguably, this is the great error of the health and wealth gospel. Health and wealth preachers on late night TV, they're looking for the not yet here in second homes, cars, jets, and money. And I promise you, Paul would say, I would count that loss compared to the suppressed. If I lost all that, I would consider that garbage. Next to knowing Christ, okay. So set your mind. And here's the contrast to the mindset on earthly things, verse 20, but circle that, that's a shift. He's gonna make a counterpoint. But our citizenship, Philippians, is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, the, look at the work he's doing, Philippians chapter one, verse seven. Look at what is coming, who will transform our lowly bodies with different appetites, different bellies, different, you see what? He will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He is doing a work in this in-between. And Paul would say, look at, fix your eyes on those who are following this example and look nowhere else. This is what God is doing. Our citizenship is here. We are a part of a different commonwealth. These are our people. Not that we are sojourners here. This is a temporary stay. It's not our bed. It's not our pillow. It's not our dishes. It's not our... And then he just repeats himself and I'm done. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. He's like, this is a better reward than me than anything I could gain in this life is just to see you following Jesus. That's my crown. And then he says this, stand firm thus. Stand firm this way. In the Lord, my beloved. Beautiful. I don't know where you're at right now in your spiritual journey. Some of you I do. But what do you want most? And if you're like, I don't know, ask the Lord to show you. David did. Search me and know me, David prayed, and see if there is any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. So David prayed. So if you're not sure what you want most, I want most, ask the Lord. He'll show you, I promise. This is what you want most. Okay, what do I? Forget what's behind both your victories and your failures and strain towards what is ahead in Christ Jesus, the upward call of God in Christ. Let's stand together. Look at Ephesians chapter five on the screen. This is another letter Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus. He says this, look carefully then how you walk. Sounds like Philippians all of a sudden. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Look at this. Making the best use of of, of the time because what? What? The days are evil. Keep, Keep your eyes on. Strain for, press on. I would encourage you, even if it's just for the day, if you can't make plans to be gone a whole week, I would encourage you to make family camp a priority this weekend in some form. This is not just sitting by a lake. This is not just s'mores. And There's a lot more going on here. And this is about keeping our eyes on those who walk according to the pattern that they have in Paul. This is about discipleship. This is about connection. This is about meeting the people of God and saying, you know what? (sighs) These are my people. 
This is my family. That's why we call it family camp. It's not because our families go camping. It's because our church family, singular, goes camping. This family. This is why we do community groups. This is why. You cannot come on a Sunday morning and listen to a today, I'm sorry, an hour-long sermon. And that's sufficient. It's important. And it's a big piece of what we do. But it can't be all of what we do. So there's questions of who are you behind? And who's out behind you? Who's looking to you? You see? Well, that changes things a little bit. Yep. Where are you walking? I better get my eyes on somebody if I got people with eyes on me. Whoa. Yep. Let me strain forward to what lies ahead. Father, um, this is not a work that we can do. Um, that is plain. This is a work that you're doing that you're going to bring to completion at the day of Christ. And I'm so grateful for that, glad for that, rejoice in that. So God, right now, I would ask on behalf of all of those here that you would expose a little bit more of their heart. We talked about this as we're going to have an increased awareness of your holiness and an increased awareness, a growing awareness of our sins. So peel back some of those uh, doors and windows. Peel it back a little bit that we can see into other spaces and And God, would you expose appetites and longings and would you confront with gentleness, the same kind of gentleness we see Paul use in the book of Philippians. Would you confront us in that space gently and would you call us to strain forward to what lies ahead to this upward call of God in Christ? Would you do that? If repentance is needed, then bring us repentance. If encouragement is needed, then encourage God, that you would appropriate the words today from Philippians chapter three to our hearts by the Holy Spirit and you would do that work that we know one day will be completed. But do today's work, not tomorrow or the next day. Like do today's work in all of our lives for your glory and our good in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen.